Welcome to this podcast on the topic of nuclear weapons in pop culture. The first part will be dedicated to a quick introduction of the topic. The second part will consist of an interview with Dr. Rhys Crilly, who specializes, among other things, uh, on book culture and world politics. In the introduction, I will talk mostly about pop culture and why should we as international relations students or scholars pay attention to it. Now, when someone hears the word international politics, most imagine the world of diplomats, presidents, military officers and states. I think that we can actually learn a lot about international politics from popular culture. The patterns and the theories that we study, um, not only, but also about the ways that states interact, are very much present in many of the expressions of pop culture, be it novels, TV shows, music, theatre plays or films. Current affairs are reflected in culture, and if we look at film production after 2001, it is a clear example. The war on terror is almost omnipresent, so <laughs> the terrorists and the good guys fighting them were a prominent topic for films and TV shows. Nonetheless, popular culture does not always need to reflect the world we live in. It can also show us possibilities of different worlds and of different international politics. I think that since young age, we gain our understanding of the world through stories, be it reading them or listening to them. And that is why culture is so important. The exposure to pop culture is so big that it would be naive to think that such phenomenon has no impact whatsoever. The research field of world politics and pop culture focuses on how world politics is reflected or reproduced in popular culture and also how the politics of pop culture shapes the dynamics of world politics. So it's a relationship that goes both ways. Some of international relations scholars still disregard the way pop culture generates and disseminates information about worlds. Within the discipline, many see pop culture and international relations as somehow connected, but in the end, completely separate entities. But it's not a view prevalent in all disciplines. If we look at cultural and post-colonial theorists, such as Adorno, Said, Lyotard, they have all presented culture as something indivisible from politics. They were able to show that the relations of power don't manifest themselves only in parliaments, summits, or in the way the states behave, but that they are virtually everywhere. And that is precisely why popular culture shouldn't be dismissed just as an entertainment for masses, but it should be regarded as a valid field of international relations scholarship. In the interview with the Dr. Crilly, we'll be talking about the way nuclear weapons are portrayed in pop culture. Contrary to most other concepts, nuclear weapons have been present in pop culture themes only after their first initial use, so after 1945, the end of the Second World War. It is important to pay attention to this, mostly because the way nuclear weapons are presented in the films and in other media, it's uh, likely to form the way global public thinks about them. It is a proven fact, and that is quite a good example actually, that after the projections of the film Day After in 1983, the public initiatives promoting disarmament increased dramatically. We will talk about that and much more with Dr. Crayley now. Okay, so let me welcome to the podcast Dr. Rhys Crelly. I'm really happy you could join me here. And I thought because your research interests are actually quite varied, maybe you can give me a quick introduction to yourself. Hey, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's great to, great to be here talking to you today. Um, yeah, I guess I do a lot of different stuff. Um, I'm currently a Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellow at the University of Glasgow, and my uh, project that I'm working on at the minute looks at, uh, I guess, uh, the development of a, of a third nuclear age um, with a focus on uh, the US and UK. So uh, I've just finished a book which should be out next year with Manchester University Press, which is called Unparalleled Catastrophe. 
uh, Life and Death in the Third Nuclear Age, which is um, all about the development of this third nuclear age, how it happened, what the kind of key issues are and what we we need to do uh, to kind of get out of this uh, dangerous moment. Uh, but in the past, I've, I've worked on uh, international broadcasting, um, I've worked on the role of social media in war and conflict and uh, pop culture and, and world politics uh, in general. So, so yeah, uh, speaking speaking to someone who's organising a podcast on uh, pop culture and politics is is right up my street. It's really good. So, uh, well, the first question is really broad. I mean, I know that throughout history there were so many pop cultural artefacts published, uh, but I wanted to ask anyway, uh, are there any common traits in how you would describe the portrayal of nuclear weapons in pop culture? Some really common themes that we can find repeating? Yeah, so there's, um, I guess there's, firstly, my own engagement with pop culture is, is subjective and there's lots of pop culture things that uh, I've not engaged with. Um, but there are some that I have and, and my interests are, are probably, you know, quite specific to, to myself. Um, but yeah, I guess the kind of the, the key traits, some of the, so there's a really interesting piece by um, a professor called Benoit Pelopidas, which is one of the best things that outlines kind of the key traits that we see in pop culture about nuclear weapons. Um, and he kind of says that there's, there's four key tropes that we see uh, about nuclear weapons and the possible that help us imagine the possibility of nuclear war um so he talks about there firstly being uh kind of films and tv shows and games that show the start of a nuclear war so they help us to imagine what a nuclear war would be like because we see it happening and starting so that might be things like dr strangelove which i don't know if you see it's kind of a classic film that came out in the 1960s and kind of ridicules um defense uh, strategists and, and military experts and politicians um, and, and things like that show how the steps that would actually lead to a nuclear war starting. So that's kind of one of the main tropes that we see in, in pop culture about nuclear weapons. And then one of the second major tropes is um, we see this this immediate aftermath of, of nuclear war where people are, you know, the bombs have just gone off. Uh, we might have seen people just before they went off and then we see them kind of dealing with this catastrophe and living in kind of a devastated world, trying to trying to make um, make ends meet, trying to trying to survive, basically. So that might be things like um, the TV show Threads that came out in the 80s or um, other um, the, the the so Threads was like a British TV show that came out in the 1980s and then there was, a, there was an American TV film called The Day After which was sort of uh, doing a similar thing and set in this kind of same period of, of the immediate aftermath. Um, and then I guess the third trope that we see is um, this kind of apocalyptic landscape or this wait for uh, the world to to kind of end so because of a nuclear war so we see things like on the beach which was um a, it's a really good novel that came out in the the 50s i think and then was made into a film at the end of the 50s and that is about um kind of a small town in australia um by the coast um and i think there's a there's a submarine there and it's basically people, the, the bombs have gone off in the Northern Hemisphere, there's been a big war um, and the fallout is kind of slowly enveloping the planet and, you know, these people in this town know that everywhere else, everyone else is dead and they're kind of just waiting for, for this big cloud to kind of get there and for everything to end. Um, and so we see things like that, that it's kind of like nuclear war is 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 leading to the end of the world and it's it's impossible to survive um and i guess the third the fourth and final trope um that um benoit talks about in his work and that i think is a really interesting trope as well is that um we see films and tv shows that might be about the the complacency of uh us as a species as states and whatnot in, in dealing with the prospect of nuclear war so um things like uh, you know we might never we might never in these films we might never see the bombs going off but we know that nuclear war is a is a distinct and real possibility so uh, that would be films like uh, war games which came out in the the 80s which is like a, about a, i don't know if you've seen it, it's about like a computer that 
mm-hmm. people try and that is going to like start a nuclear war unless you can can beat it and uh, in the end the best strategy to to survive is to to not play the game um but yeah they're kind of the main things that we see um yeah yeah that's that's good you mentioned this because i think most of these topics are repeated until the end of cold war so i was mm-hmm. wondering is there something that changed after 1991 i mean is it still a topic in pop culture or is it kind of receding yeah so it sort of um recedes doesn't it from from popular uh, imagination well i guess from from more so political discourse but also from popular discourse and pop culture um and that's kind of this uh a scholar called ken booth calls it nuclear amnesia uh it's this Mm -hmm. notion that we we forget we've we've suddenly you know the cold war's over we're all friends as fukuyama says history's ended liberal democracy is as one um therefore we don't have to worry about nuclear weapons anymore um and of course we still do like they're still there and whilst there's great reductions in the number of them you know the us russia and all the other nuclear weapon states you know they mm. keep and maintain their arsenals um but what we see is the shift from viewing the prospect of nuclear war as a as a major global threat and um new threats emerge whether that's um but well, new threats don't just emerge, but the new threats become kind of more prominent in uh, popular mm. imagination and in political discourse. So that might be something like, uh, you know, the rise of the threat of terrorism and then with 9-11 and um, the global war on terror and terrorism becomes something that kind of dominates pop culture for 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 decades or, or however long. Um, you know, films like uh, or TV shows like 24 are becoming really popular um, mm. and they do have they do have this nuclear element though, right? So in, I think one of the, I can't remember which season, I think in the second season of 24, I don't know if you, you might be too young to remember 24, but yeah. at the time I, I absolutely <laughs> loved it. Uh, I watched it every every week with my mum and dad. And um, so it's, the, the show, for those of you who might not have seen it, is about like a American special agent called Jack Bauer who has to, he has 24 hours and each episode of the show is one hour long and he has to, you know, stop the terrorists from doing something really bad. Mm. And in one episode, it, I think in season two, he, he has to stop them from detonating a, a nuclear weapon. Um, and he does. And then in season four, I think he a, a, a nuclear weapon actually goes off in Los Angeles, detonated by some terrorists. Um, so whilst kind of the threat of nuclear weapons being used still kind of bubbles away under the surface throughout from the end of the Cold War onwards until relatively recently, I would say the main concern in the kind of realm of nuclear threats is about terrorists um, using a nuclear bomb rather than a, a state uh, like Russia and a state like America kind of going to war. Um, but I think now that might be shifting. And I think there are some things in popular culture that we could maybe talk about that suggest that once again, people are thinking about the prospect of a kind of a a full-scale nuclear conflict. So do you think that's caused by the Russian aggression, that suddenly it's again a topic that is emerging and we might be seeing some more films or TV shows around this topic? Yeah, I definitely think that's a, a key part of it. Um, what uh, Putin and, and Russia has done recently has, um, it, you know, in invading Ukraine has been like brutally horrific and it's been accompanied by threats to use nuclear weapons and it's... Um, yeah, I think it's definitely got people like so many lots of articles in in the press. And, um, you know, it's one of these things that just anecdotally talking to people, you know, they know that I've been working on this project for since 2020. And they're like, oh, all of a sudden, like, Reese, hey, you 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 study nuclear weapons. Like, are we are we going to die in a nuclear war? And it's like, Whoa, I hope not. Um, but, you know, the, it's, it's not likely, but the prospect is there. Um, it's not zero. Um, so, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, but. I think you've got to remember that relations between the US and Russia have been deteriorating for, you know, quite a few years now. Um, and in, in I, w- I would say that this new nuclear age that we're in, the third nuclear age, as some people call it, is, um, you know, didn't begin with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but began a few years ago uh, with things like Trump. And, and Putin withdrawing from the uh, INF Treaty, which was a, a Cold War treaty negotiated in 1987, which kind of banned an entire class of 
uh, nuclear capable missiles with a within a certain range. Um, so, you know, things like that have, have like led to a steady decline in, um, I guess, strategic stability or um, kind of peaceful relations between between the nuclear powers and um, so yeah things are things are getting bad and I think there's there's also been uh, you know pop culture interesting pop culture things about nuclear weapons mm. and this kind of new nuclear age that have come out I guess before Russia's in, invasion of Ukraine that, that we can maybe talk about as well. Yeah yeah I wanted to actually go back to the book because I read the annotation and I think that usually when we talk about pop culture we mostly examine like films, TV shows, books but you actually mentioned you even looked into pop songs so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah so um, so yeah one of the one of the songs that I talk about in my book um, is a song by a guy called Sam Fender who I don't know I don't know how popular he is outside of the UK have, have you heard of him is he I don't know him but it's no? not yeah it, does, it but, doesn't yeah. need to be a point of reference honestly <laughs> no no I don't I don't expect um I don't expect people outside of the UK to have heard of him but he's he's quite good um he's from wow. New, he's from Newcastle so he's like a Geordie guy he's working class he he sings about very political issues um whether that's like growing up um in kind of poverty or growing up in the context of austerity mm -hmm. as a young working class kind of man um and um he he kind of he sounds like Bruce Springsteen a bit so he's he sounds if you can imagine a Geordie version of Bruce Springsteen he's mm -hmm. got that kind of epic guitar rocky kind of rocky but quite poppy um sound to him and uh in in 2019 uh he released a song uh, called Hypersonic Missiles and uh that song becomes uh you know one of his most popular songs it kind of builds him this star status in in the uk um and it was the song itself hypersonic missiles was uh, the bbc radio one's uh, hottest record of the year in 2019 wow. so it was like voted by uh listeners of bbc radio one which is like the most poppy radio station in the uk um it was voted by listeners of that station as, as the hottest record of that year. And the song's all about um, all about him kind of consuming American culture and there being wars going on and him being oblivious to them and not really knowing what to do and not being able to do anything. And then kind of the, the chorus is about there it being a high time for hypersonic missiles. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting that there's like this pop song that in the UK at least is really popular that's all about you know, a new nuclear weapons technology, right? It's kind of unusual. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, and that's one of the key kind of instances of pop culture, at least in the UK, that is about kind of this new nuclear age and kind of saying like, oh, uh, you know, things are things are a bit sketchy, things are things are seeming a bit wild, and 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 it's just an, it's an interesting song. You should definitely listen to it and. Uh, uh, check it out if you've not heard it. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely will. It sounds really interesting. Uh, well, uh, based on that, I guess that not all portrayals of nuclear weapons are actually correct, either in the song or in the films and TV shows. Uh, so what would you say is actually the biggest misconception that people have around nuclear weapons or around the nuclear war as such? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think you'd have to, there's, there's people that do research on public opinion that will probably have much more informative um, answers than than I do. But I think um, one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, so, so let's kind of st take a step back, basically. And I think it's important to note that with nuclear weapons, right, they have such a destructive capability um, and it's really hard for us to actually imagine what that might be like and of course we can you know look at what happened in the american bombing of hiroshima and nagasaki in 1945 and see kind of the effects of of, of what happened to the people and the places um that were where, where nuclear weapons have been used but it's really hard to imagine what you know what would a a, a large-scale nuclear war look like what would it involve what would it what would it do right there's research that recently shows that um 
you know, if just like 100 nuclear weapons were used out of the 13,000 that are out there in the world, um, it would cause millions of direct casualties and would also probably uh, lead to at least 2 billion people dying from a lack of food because global food supply chains would be so affected by the the climate change that would be caused by the um, kind of the, the soot that's released in the, the burning of buildings and the, the use of the bombs. Um, so, so it's really hard to imagine in the first place, right? Which is why I think pop culture is so important when thinking about nuclear weapons, because it's one of the ways, it's, it's one of the main ways in which we actually kind of know and think about and, and come to, to kind of imagine this as a possibility, right? Um, and I think the biggest mix, misconception basically comes down to the fact that people seem to have an understanding that these things are dangerous um, and that they will cause catastrophic damage if they're ever used. But despite that, people still seem to support their states or uh, their state's allies kind of having nuclear weapons. So there's been some interesting polling that's come out after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has kind of said, oh, look, if you look at these states across um, Eastern Europe, they'd like to have they'd like to host American nuclear weapons uh, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to ensure their security. But, you know, when you ask people, would you like them to be used? They're like, no, of course not. So people seem to buy into this idea of deterrence, which um, I think is is perhaps quite concerning. Um, if we look at someone like Benoit Pelopidis's work, who I mentioned earlier, and and he he has done research into near misses throughout the Cold War, and uh, he kind of s demonstrates that one of the biggest misconceptions we have about nuclear weapons is that we can actually control them um, without. A, a large amount mm -hmm. of, of luck. Um, so, um, yeah, essentially the, the short answer is that there's this misconception that we can control nuclear weapons and can avoid either conflict escalation or their accidental detonation. Um, whereas if you actually look at some of the near misses that we've had throughout the Cold War, whether that's um, during crises like the Cuban Missile Crisis or whether it's in some of the instances where nuclear um, weapons have uh, like you know been accidentally dropped out of planes or planes have crashed and car that, that have been carrying them um you know it, it's it's entirely down to luck that they didn't detonate so it's you know i think there was five fail safe mechanisms on one nuclear weapon that was dropped um i think in spain and four of them failed and only one of them actually worked and that's kind of like terrifying um and there's other instances where um i saw benoit talk about this in a presentation once there was a plane that caught fire on a on the ground uh, air force base somewhere and um it had nuclear bombs on the, under the wings uh and the fire basically because of the wind blowing in a certain direction the fire didn't go anywhere near the the bombs um and it's it's kind of like well if the wind had been blowing another direction it, it would be a very different story um so yeah i think that's probably the biggest misconception is that we can have total control over nuclear weapons and we can avoid escalation and we can avoid accidents um, Okay. And do you think that maybe pop culture could be a tool that we use to somehow reframe this? Like actually say that we really don't have any control over nuclear weapons and that we should opt for disarmament? Yeah, yeah, I think pop culture can definitely play a role in, in that. And I think it, it definitely already does um, and has done throughout throughout the Cold War. So, um, so Reagan, Ronald Reagan himself, he he wrote in his diaries after viewing the day after the film the tv film that came out in 1983 that showed the effects of an, a, a nuclear war in um, in i forget which american state it is um but he he wrote in his diary like oh this is a really powerful piece of tv drama um and he's an actor himself right so he's you know viewing it and yeah. he's appreciating it and he says oh it seems like the disarmament uh people are winning the argument um and he writes about how you know he we need to make sure that we can get rid of you know now we need to get rid of these things and um, ensure that they're never used um and that i think was one of the things that perhaps led to him uh negotiating the inf treaty in 1987 which is this kind of first big uh bilateral um arms control treaty that that disarms an entire class of weapons that the US and, and Russia have, uh, the Soviet Union have at the time. 
Um, so yeah, it's an important factor. Um, and you see pop culture, you know, kind of being critical of deterrence, being critical of, of these things throughout the, um, throughout the Cold War and, and, and onwards. But, um, but yeah, it's not like the only thing. So like, at the same time as um, Reagan was watching the day after, you know, the, the year before in 1982, there'd been one of the biggest ever anti-war protests in, in the US, in New York. Um, in uh, the, the same year, there'd been the Green and Common Women's Peace Camp um, in, in the UK. So you have these kind of big protest movements as well and, and pop culture. And it's all, you know, it's, it's hard to really distill like... Um, causality down you can't say like oh if only we made more critical pop culture then we'd get rid of the, the nukes like it's, yeah. it's probably not quite that simple but it's it's like for sure pop culture can play a role in in kind of critiquing these things and and i guess it laying the helping to lay the conditions of possibility for for, for disarmament so yeah, if we go back to the misconceptions um mm -hmm. because you also focus in your research on social media I was wondering if it actually also plays a role to some extent, because what comes to my mind is always the the interaction between Trump and uh, the North Korean leader on Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, like who has the bigger button, that sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, so would you say that it's also important in this regard? Yeah, definitely. I think social media plays a plays a key role and, and can't be can't be ignored when we talk about pop culture nowadays, can it? Um, because it's something that so many people engage with on a daily basis. Um, and yeah, it's, um, I've, so I've, I've done a preliminary study of some, uh, how people, that, I've done a preliminary study of popular Facebook content on the topic of, of nuclear weapons and, and other nuclear issues. And what I've found with that is that, so, I, so I've collected like 20,000 popular Facebook posts published from 2016 until this year. And one of the most interesting things about that data set, which I think speaks to this issue of misconceptions, is the fact that so many of the most popular Facebook posts on nuclear topics during this um, time period are published by really right wing Facebook pages. So whether that's Fox News, uh, politicians like um, Lindsey Graham and other kind of, um, you know, people like Ben Shapiro, these right wing commentators. So I think the top two publishers in this data set that I've got are Fox News and Ben Shapiro. And it's kind of like, OK, that's not why I expected. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I might have thought that uh, US Strategic Command was at the top, this kind of, you know, the mm. authoritative military voice, but they're not even in, you know, the top 30 pages. Um, so, yeah, and this this is something that I need to dive into the data and look at, you know, how these people are actually representing nuclear issues. But I think based on what we know about them, um, mm. They're probably not, uh, you know, producing like super truthful stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I need to do more research, but I think it is it's definitely a role. And there's there's a whole bunch of other issues that need further research about whether that's the personalization of algorithms and, you know, the content I see about yeah. nuclear weapons is probably very different to what yeah. you might see and what no, um, so. other people might see depending on the pages that you follow um mm. so yeah it's a really complex um issue that that needs needs more research but um but yeah um i think it's definitely definitely something that's important yeah 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 i'd say so i think it will probably turn out to be quite important in the future as well uh well uh, if we move on to another topic uh it's pop culture nuclear weapons and gender Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if you can actually see um, nuclear weapons in pop culture portraits as a gendered thing, really, if mm -hmm. we can somehow talk about this. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a, a, a really important issue. And, um, you know, going back to, to Carol Cohn's, uh, you know, really influential mm -hmm. piece in uh, 1987, where she talks about kind of the gendered uh language that is used and the gendered roles that uh people who work in this kind of techno strategic realm um so she she does like a, a, a an ethnography basically with people that work in the the nuclear yeah. field nuclear policy field um and kind of writes an amazing piece about 
the role of gender there. Um, so it's not explicitly about pop culture, um, but I think you can draw upon what she says and think about her ideas in regards to um, the pop culture that's out there. Um, so I guess what would be what would be an interesting thing to talk about um, in terms of, of gender. Um, so I guess we could talk about Doctor Strangelove and the role of role of gender there and the kind of um, yeah the kind of like masculine um, mm. like cowboy kind of identity of the people that just mm. really want to to go to war and use nuclear weapons and it's kind of a parody of that military masculinity of being like strong gung ho and um, kind of critiques the threat that that poses. Uh, I guess more recently, um, there's um, interesting things, I guess, about the new Top Gun film and about kind of mm -hmm. Tom Cruise as this kind of, you know, masculine figure who who needs to go and stop uranium being enriched in this mysterious um, place. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess an interesting an interesting thing for me to talk about in terms of gender um, and, and pop culture which might be a bit niche for you and I, I don't know if you you even this is even on your radar but um in the run-up to the UK general election in 2019 there was mm -hmm. a fascinating uh, there, there was a, a big discussion at the time about because uh, Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party and he's a lifetime member of uh, CND the campaign for nuclear disarmament um and there was a whole a whole kind of thing in the press that was about oh with Corbyn becomes prime minister what's he going to do with the nukes would he be prepared to push the button um will he renew trident um and so that this was just a big kind of issue in the, in the election and there was a fascinating interview with um the leader of the liberal democrat party um a woman called Joe Swinson and she was asked in this interview would you be prepared to to use a a nuclear weapon and she just immediately responds yes I would um absolutely and the interviewer responds like oh excellent great answer thank you very much um and then um this causes a, a bit of a stir at least in kind of left-wing circles and um so the Scottish first minister Nicola Sturgeon who who is also anti anti-nuclear lifetime member of CND as well and mm -hmm. she she writes this really interesting um op-eds in the Guardian kind of critiquing this this jump to immediately say that you'd be prepared to unleash like destruction on, no. on wherever mm -hmm. and uh, so Sturgeon talks about how this has now become framed as like this test of virility and if you want to be like a serious politician in the UK um, and you want to be the Prime Minister you need to have this kind of really masculine like view of just being ready to to you know use these these weapons that you know are going to kill like millions of people right um so there's there's all these gendered elements in all these different aspects of pop culture whether that's the news media whether that's kind of these films or whatever but yeah it definitely plays this plays a key role i think this idea that um you know nuclear weapons are bound up with notions of being strong powerful um masculine and um and and those things are kind of privileged in in societies and and you know lead to lots of um, you know awful things where you know taking a, a feminist approach to foreign policy might yeah. provide um, other other ways of uh, you know ensuring security and stuff. Uh, was there, uh, if we talk about the UK politics, was there actually any difference in the way that Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak would talk about this, or would they just take the stance of the Conservative Party? Yes, they both. Um, I think they both were asked about it in the in the run up to the election, and they they both kind mm -hmm. of said it. I think there was a really, I saw a video. There was a really concerning moment where Truss was asked in the run up. Uh, in one of the leadership debates and she she got this like crazy round of applause after saying like yes I would do it um, and I think the question had even been prefaced with like you know this will cause like thousands of casualties and uh, mm -hmm. would you still do it and she was just like yes of course um, and it's it's I, d I don't know you could maybe like 
so I have a, you know, I'm critical of that view, but I can, you know, if you're, if you're going to be, if you're going to buy into deterrence and if you're going to kind of have this view of nuclear weapons as a, you know, something that we need to ensure security, then I would at least like you, if you're going to be our prime minister, to have a little bit of critical reflection about what that might involve yeah, um, totally. rather totally. than just jumping at the, the chance to say, yes, absolutely. I'm big, strong and masculine and, and whatnot. And was, was the question at least framed as like, would you use nuclear weapons as a response to nuclear attack? Was it just like a general one? Like, would you actually um, use it? I think it was more general. I don't, it wasn't like specific. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think it was specific. Like Russia have mm. launched a, I, I can't remember. Mm. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. I think it was like, um, would you, would you do it basically? Let's see. Okay, uh, and would you see that's pretty much the last question on this topic, but uh, would you see that uh, what we're seeing on TV, uh, especially in the nuclear weapons arena, uh, could actually potentially have had an impact on the number of women who were involved in drafting policies regarding nuclear weapons in general? Do you think that there is a link that can be made or is it just very vague? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, it's a difficult question, I think, to 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 prove to like, I guess, provide like evidence to. Um, but yeah, I think so. I think um, I think when when things are represented as so masculine and as so, um, you know, something that is like militarily uh, militarily necessary and like you know it's about national security and defense um i think these these areas themselves are, are often very masculine and attract like masculine kind of people to to want to work in them um and i think that is problematic for several reasons because it leads to you know quite a narrow view of what security should be and how it can be maintained and uh, who should be protected from what and so on um and yeah there i think there is like a need definitely to to diversify the field um for a whole bunch of reasons as kind of carol Cohn has been talking about since the since the 1980s um and I'm not particularly convinced that we're in a much better place today than we were when she was writing that. Um, you know, you, you, if you go to like some of the, the the mainstream kind of international relations conferences or security conferences on these things, you'll see lots of white men. Um, you know, women are still a minority in um, in these in these spaces, and you still see manals on like nuclear politics and national security. Um, and yeah, at least like a very narrow perspective of, of, of nuclear politics, right? Um, and yeah, pop culture's role in that. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's probably plays a role in, in shaping what women think they can do and what, where they should work and, you know, you, you know, yeah. from from kids right we're we're influenced by ideas about gender and you know pink for girls blue for boys it's like you know, i've got a i've got a three-year-old daughter and you kind of see this with the toys that she wants to play with and it's like you know i'm not, I'm not going out and like only buying her uh like pink things and frozen like elsa stuff but that's kind of what she wants because it's what her friends like and uh, you kind of socialized yeah. into certain ways of uh, being and, and certain identities and so um so yeah pop culture will play a role i think in shaping the nuclear field but there's also kind of structural issues across society in general yeah, that kind absolutely. of limit what what women what fields women go into and and yeah we need to try and overcome them and, and open up um the field of of um nuclear politics and and feminists are doing a, a really good job of doing that i think some of the most interesting yeah. work on um nuclear politics um, and critical nuclear studies takes like a feminist perspective 
Um, there's a really, really good special issue of international affairs, the journal, which is one of the most prominent international relations journals in the world. Um, there's a special issue on uh, feminist and post-colonial approaches to, to nuclear uh, uh, politics, um, okay. which was published, which was edited by um, Shine Choi and, and Catherine Eschel. Um, so that's, you know, kind of a really yeah. prominent thing. And it's really interesting. Every article in there is like fascinating. Um, and obviously Carol Cohn, um, Carol Cohn and uh, Teresa Taylor's work in the 1980s, like, you know, women have been doing some of the most interesting in work on on nuclear studies since, you know, for decades, uh, even if yeah. even if they might be the minority in the in the field. Mm. I mean, I guess it, I guess we'll see if there is actually a change in the future. But well, to end on a more positive note, is there a book or an article that you would recommend to someone interested, not only in the field of pop culture, but just the nuclear weapons non-proliferation? Oh wow, that's a great question. I'm. Um, it's really hard to narrow it down to one, so I'm going to suggest. What am I going to suggest? I'm, I'm going to suggest Carol Cohn's 1987 mm -hmm. piece on um, yeah. sex and death in the rational world of defense intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a great read. It's it's fascinating on its own terms and it's it's still really relevant today. Um, alongside that, if you're interested in um, pop culture and nuclear weapons um, work by Benoit Pelopides, um, this, I'm going to have to just check the specific name of the chapter that's worth a read. Um, I think it came out in French, but you can get a, an, an, an English copy uh, online. Mm -hmm. It's called Imagine the Possibility of Nuclear War to Deal with It, the Role of Visual Popular Culture from 1950 to the Present Day. Um, and it's open access in a journal called Culture, Cultures and Conflicts. And that's kind of like a really good introduction to, to someone who um, is either interested in or might even be critical of thinking about pop culture and nuclear weapons. So, um, so yeah, check those two things out. They'd be my um, top <laughs> recommendations. Okay, then thanks a lot for the recommendations <laughs> and for being here, really. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for, um, for having me.